Welcome. Can everyone hear me all right? Everyone see the screen except for what is not loading. So now is the part of the talk where you wholeheartedly boo the speaker for not downloading his own slides locally before relying on the DEF CON Wi-Fi to give the talk. So let's, let's hear a big old, big old boo for my lack of preparedness. I fucked it up already. So this is actually a little bit appropriate though given a lot of what I'm going to talk about because what you, if you were here for the talk an hour ago when we with Physical Security Village gave the Bypass 101 talk, we were talking about all the elite hacks that you can do to hack into s physical systems and get them to behave in ways that they're not supposed to. A lot of what this talk is going to end up converging on is not doing advanced elite hacks yourself but just systems that don't work the way they're supposed to in the first place. And Wi-Fi as we're seeing is one of them. So we'll, we'll get the vi visuals that we can and I'll talk you through the rest. But um, every time you see one of these images that doesn't load, keep in mind that is the exact same failure mode as a lot of physical security systems that don't operate as intended and that's some of the things that we're going to focus on in this talk. So we're going to go over a bunch of a very high level of the type of bypasses, type of security that we need to concern about. So bypass, lock picking, forcible entry, we'll talk about that a little bit, alarm and detection and then surveillance, what to focus on, how to bring it up and how to get action, all of this in the context of an internal employee where your main job description is not auditing the company's physical security. So there's a lot of people and we get a lot of questions at the village about this. People that notice flaws in their employer's physical security, wonder how to bring it up, what's important and so that's what we're going to talk about here. And I'm going to hammer this through throughout the talk. A lot of what is most critical to bring up is stupid shit. So let's watch some videos of stupid shit. If we can. All right, so the door is locked, doesn't open, hit the, uh, hit the accessibility button and it pops right open. So this is a surprisingly common failure mode. It is a simple misconfiguration in the programming software or in the wiring. When it's a wiring problem it is just, it thinks this is the accessibility button on the inside, the secure side of the door and it causes that system to unlock the door and cause it to open up. So stupid shit, misconfigurations like that. You also get stupid shit like this, lock cage, reach around, slam the bar and you're through. There's a couple reasons that stupid shit like this is so relevant to security in general but also to internal employees bringing it up. Number one from security in general is a threat modeling perspective. Hitting the accessibility button, reaching around, that's something that any idiot can look at and see this is something that might work and they can try it. It takes no skill whatsoever. When you're bringing up flaws to particularly your own employer, the less skill it takes, the better in terms of them understanding the criticality of that problem. If it's a, an advanced, high skilled, high barrier to entry attack that you're demonstrating, the more it shows off your skills as an attacker, the less relevant it is from a threat modeling perspective. And so that is why systems that just plain old don't work, like Wi-Fi sometimes, is, is something that uh, is most relevant for this. So I'm going to switch off of the presenter mode here and we'll see what we can see. So latch targeted bypass is something that we talk about in Bypass 101 and the physical security village right across the hall here, quick show of hands, who has uh, checked us out so far? A lot of people. For those who haven't, I highly recommend it. Everything I'm going to talk about in this talk, you can try it for yourself in the village. These latches allow self-closing doors to self-latch and self-lock afterwards. You can often stick a tool in just like we're showing in this picture here and retract that latch, pull the door open. So again, really low skilled, easy to demonstrate, easy to show to someone at your workplace of anyone with a bent wire can do this and open this locked door. And that's something that really gets, gets results there. 
This dead latch is what's meant to prevent that. That little half moon there. Those half moon designs by the way are terrible because if that dead latch is retracted it will prevent you from pushing it in. You can try that out in the village. When it falls into the strike plate hole that allows you to do that latch targeted bypass. So bypasses that are easy, quick to demonstrate are by far the best ones to bring up in that context. Lock picking is somewhat relevant. If you're a skilled enough lock picker, this is something that you can bring up. If you see a critical installation behind a poorly done lock, that might be something you want to do. As with all lock picking, ask permission before you attempt to pick any locks. Right? With, with that stupid shit before where you reach around and, and hit the thing, it's like, that's something that any idiot can see and do. As soon as you stick a pick into a keyway, you now run afoul of possibly the law, depending on your jurisdiction, possibly ethics, and very likely your employer's code of conduct. So ask permission there. But when you have permission and if you see a lock that you know, I can pick that. That's very easy. It should not be protecting all of our inventory or all of our PII or whatever it is that you have behind that, that locked door in that locked cabinet, whatever it is. You can either ask permission and half the time you don't even need to demonstrate. You can just tell them, I know a lot about this. This lock is not well suited for the job. I will call attention to Leashy Tools briefly. Who has heard about these before? A good chunk of people in the room. These are a game changer when it comes to threat modeling and I suspect that in the next five or ten years we're going to see more and more criminals on a lower level using them because they are so damn easy to pick. So next time you're at work or even at home, if your keyway looks like this, with the little Z shape at the bottom, that Schleg C keyway. If it says Schleg on top, you're okay. Schleg locks are well made, they have security pins, they're tight tolerances. They're still very pickable with these leashes, but it takes at least a little bit of skill. If it says nothing on top, that means it's a Chinese clone of a Schleg C keyway. Picking is very easy just raking, but with these leashes it makes it trivial. No skill required whatsoever. And so that's, that's a tool you can look up. And if you use those in your workplace, particularly for higher security, higher criticality doors, at the very least you want to use the proper Schlage, but ideally switch it out for a higher security lock that this tool does not exist for. The last thing that leashes are capable of is these numbers along the back here. Once you pick the lock, you can actually read off the number and make a key for that lock based on picking it once and the information that tool pulls out for you. So again, something that if your employer doesn't want someone with 30 seconds of access to the lock to be able to then make a key that works forevermore, it's worth bringing up. Forcible entry is worth talking about even though in the FizSec village we talk about lock bypass a lot and covert entry, how you can get in without damaging stuff, your threat model in the real world is usually forcible entry. And so that's something that, wh that's why I've taglined this, why hackers often get physical security wrong. You need to think about what's actually going to be done. No door is invulnerable. Any door can be breached with sufficient force, skill, time, money and motivation. And forcible entry is usually the way to do that. So this image here is a Halligan tool. It is what firefighters use. There is a full science to this that has been developed over the past 80 years that firefighters use to get into burning buildings as fast as possible. Criminals are not quite so fast. They're a little bit louder. They have a different set of tools and techniques that they use. But any door can be forced with sufficient time. The defense against that is detection and response. And we're going to drill that into this talk as well. You need to think about your threat modeling when talking about forcible entry. So if say you, you, you look this up a bit, you, you learn about thermal lances and various advanced forcible entry tools, that's usually not within the threat model for most employers and most, most facilities. Um, U, uh, or UFC 402001 has a good taxonomy of that. So if you want a nice science based way to explain what the forcible entry resistance of a door is going to be without actually forcing it and damaging it, this is a great reference doc for you. So we'll switch back into slide mode, see if videos load. 
and you want to look at the full set of hardware as well. So this is an Abloy lock, Abloy ProTech, it is not going to be picked. The locking hardware itself has not given in the forced entry, this hollow wooden door has just splintered like a toothpick. And so even just knocking on a door, pushing it with your palm, giving it a prod with your knee, you can feel where that door gives. And you can get a feel for, if I were to hit this with a battering ram with my shoulder, give it a good kick, where is that door going to give, is it going to give, and that's something that is relevant if you have items of value or that would be a great problem to your company from a secrecy perspective, for instance, if it got out. So I talked about the, um, the science that firefighters use to lever doors open. What often happens is something like this. So we see burglar walking along carrying a gym bag full of tools. Gym bags full of tools, by the way, are one of their biggest uh, carrying cases of choice. And so we're going to see how he uses this crowbar to actually lever that door open. So there's lots of places you can get purchase around the jam here. And we'll take a look at his advanced uh, technique that he uses. Nope, right through the window. Right, so a big old window like that. It's good for people to see in and to merchandise the store during open hours, but that's just a little door for him at that point. Right, so again, depending on the money you want to spend to harden that door, detection and response is your ideal situation there. What happens in real life in situations like this, by the way, is he walks the block and he cases it out. And he's going to look for stores that have a vulnerability like that. And so it's like the old joke about you just have to outrun your friend, not the bear. You just have to be more secure than your neighbor. And that's going to cause low level attackers like this to go somewhere else. And that applies in a threat model where you're just protecting money, you're just protecting assets of a relatively low value. He's going to go in and he knows to be in and out in five minutes, right? He's going to grab, the till should be empty but anything of value there, any merchandise of value, sma literally a smash and grab in and out in five minutes. So if you see a jam like this, thin wood veneer, one and a half inch screws holding these metal strike plates in, that's going to survive one kick and someone's through. So forcible entry is worth considering. To secure a site, you need detectors on the entire perimeter or the interior, delay the intruder, and respond fast enough with greater force to stop someone who has forced their way in. In the interest of time, we'll skip through a few. There are some alarm bypasses that we talk about in the village. So if you have detection that's a magnetic contact sensor, and that magnet can be bypassed by holding a surrogate magnet up to it that's something that is a whole lot less common to see and is not in many threat models of someone that's just smashing the window open. But you know what, if they smash that window open and walk through the window, at no point does the door open, at no point does that contact sensor trip, and that person is inside without tripping the alarm. And so that's why something like an internal area s detector is worth considering. We also have PIR sensors in the village and a cool little corridor you can walk back and try to evade those. And so that's something you can practice, get hands on with it and go back to your workplace and be like, I successfully evaded this at DEF CON, here's how I did it and assess whether it's in your threat model for an attacker to actually try that. So we'll skip through a bunch in the interest of time. This is probably the most important diagram to understand for most workplaces. This is a standard setup for an electronic access control door. So you tap your fob, the door opens and you enter. What's important to consider now is what happens when you exit and what happens when someone forces in. When you exit, you tap or you don't tap the fob, you just approach the door on the secure side and this request to exit sensor, it uses passive infrared technology, detects that someone is exiting, it's going to tell the alarm controller, someone's on the inside, someone's exiting, when the door opens and is detected by this magnetic contact sensor, it says suppress the alarm, someone's exiting. When someone enters, they tap their badge here, and then it detects door open, someone's entered normal entry, no problem. If that door gets forced open, we have contact sensor breached, 
no exit detected here, no card swipe, that's when it's going to send a door forest alarm. What happens with these door forest alarms 80% of the time is nothing. They get logged somewhere, sometimes they don't even get logged, there is no response. And so we're not talking about hacking a functional system, we're talking about a system that was not functional from the start. Stupid shit. And that's the type of thing that is really going to get employers' attentions and is worth bringing up before you start talking about hacks and bypasses and how you can cause a functional system to not work as intended. This is one of those things that's worth bringing up as well. Quick show of hands, who has seen or heard of the canned air attack where you trip those requests to exit sensors? So for those who haven't, it's where you spray canned air upside down under the door or through the door and it hits this request to exit sensor, it finds a thermal signature different than ambient, the door thinks someone is then leaving and half the time it will actually unlock the door at the mag strike here or at the very least it will disable that door forced alarm and let you force your way through without setting off an alarm. That's something that's worth trying and if that succeeds at your workplace it is worth bringing that up. Uh, going through events, in the interest of time we'll, we'll skip that. So a quick checklist to follow of just does your access control system function as intended? Does it allow entry to the correct card, deny entry to the wrong card? You would be surprised how often that is misconfigured. Does it reliably allow egress without false alarming? Often these things are tuned too narrowly or the timing is set up wrong so that it doesn't correctly associate the two events of request to exit trip and contact sensor open, false alarms too much. What do facilities man managers do when they get too many false alarms? They just turn off the damn alarm. And now you've got no detection, people can freely bypass forcible entry, etc. Prop the door open for five minutes. Does it alarm? There should be door held detection on these things. If there is not, simply propping open the door, coming in open hours, propping it coming back later, let someone in, no detection whatsoever, and the door of course is propped and unlocked. And then simulate a forced entry. Test that that alarm system works, that it goes somewhere, that someone actually responds. How do you simulate a forced entry? So we'll pop back the diagram here. You stand at the door, you wait for this detector to click back off so it thinks it's been too long since someone's been at the door and then you carefully open that door without tripping the request to exit sensor. Alternatively, you can do a bypass from the unsecure side, under door tool, poke the latch, etc. Simulating a forced entry t and testing whether that alarm actually gets set off. Cameras are also worth looking at. It is worth simply asking your employer, can I look at the camera feed once you've established that you know something about this field and see if it would actually be useful. If there's some sort of crime or malfeasance here, is this going to give us any value whatsoever? Absolutely not. It is far too far, far too grainy to see license plates, to see faces and we've got major washing out of the light contrast here. So lighting and cameras go hand in hand. If you have a camera that's directly illuminated, you can just look at it and see there's, there's a floodlight on this camera. Well, that's what it's going to look like here. IR glare, cameras directly create the infrared light for night vision. When you see that with an object too close, it washes out the whole rest of the field of view. In this case, it might have been a camera setup that was fine when it was installed and then this tree grew over the, the subsequent years. So something worth looking at there as well. And then of course just resolution as well. A 360 degree camera gives you absolutely nothing to go off in terms of faces, license plates, the sort of thing that's actually going to be useful for investigating if something happens down the road. And again, stupid shit. Tampering, blocking and repositioning. Reach up this camera, point it at the sky. Stuff like this. Think about the third dimension. Someone coming in from the top and, and accessing those. A nice ladder is provided here to get access to that camera up there and we see all the time cameras that, that get vandalized, repositioned, etc. in order to, to bypass that detection there. So quick test your camera coverage that you can do 
once you've established a bit of, of rapport with your facilities team. Do a walkthrough of your facility, entrances, exits, sensitive areas to be protected, and then check the footage after of that walkthrough. Can you see identifying per details of the person on tape, read license plates on vehicles, when is the person not in view, can you tell what the person is doing, and then try in situations like at night, shutting off power, inclement weather, in all of these cases, do you still have useful information? And if not, that's something that's worth bringing up. And of course, when dealing with any business, and we do this all the time, but particularly your own employer as an internal employee, you need to understand their threat model, what they're protecting, and the risks involved. So if the probability is very low, it takes a lot of skill, effort, et cetera, to do it, and the impact is not catastrophic to the business, the dollar value associated with fixing it that would make it worth it has to be very low. If it's going to be an expensive fix, that's not worth it to do. And so applying everything over to this risk matrix here helps you prioritize in your mind what is worth bringing up. Because if you bring up a whole bunch of low criticality items, they're going to stop taking you seriously. So bring up the most, most critical, the easiest to demonstrate. Again, that stupid shit, that reaching around and hitting the, um, the, the crash bar, that hitting the button on the other side, misconfiguration, systems that don't work correctly in the first place. And then once you've got the system working correctly, then you can start hardening against bypasses where it matches your threat model correctly. So make a note of all findings, bring up the most critical to underscore importance, and get connected with your internal facilities team if there is one. If it's a small employer and there isn't, maybe that's going to become part of your job. And that's something to think about if you want that to be the case. If you're here at this talk, if you're interested in this, you probably would love that to be the case. Uh, and don't be a pedant about low probability, low impact findings, prioritize things. And again, focus on getting systems working as intended before worrying about the bypasses. So everything I've talked about today and a whole lot more, you can try in the physical security village just across the hall. I'll be beside the stage after this to take any questions. And thank you very much. Thank you.